Some of my friends are into wine as much as I'm into trains. And that's saying something in both directions. Every once in a while, when they find a really special wine, they'll buy an extra bottle, put it in their cellar, and take it out only after decades have passed. With that much age, a lot of wines can turn to vinegar. But for some, they can grow in richness and complexity. But that's me in June of 2000, neither rich nor complex, and just barely old enough to drink wine. I was in my junior year of college in Cleveland, Ohio, and I spent seven months of it doing an extended internship in Phoenix, Arizona. I can't say that I cared all that much for Phoenix, or the internship, but I sure fell hard for Arizona. It was a coming of age for me, and my first time living on my own. I spent most weekends out exploring the desert and its railroads, and it was on those trips that I really started to embrace photography. I wasn't very good at it, but I was discovering how much I enjoyed the pursuit and the creative process. On Memorial Day weekend, two of my railfan friends from college came to visit, and they took me to Copper Country in the far eastern part of Arizona, to the otherworldly open pit of the Marinci Mine and the spectacular railroads that meet in Clifton to serve it. I was so taken by the place that, before my internship ended just two months later, I returned four times. Photographically, I don't have much to show for those efforts. It was summer, and the trains ran in the middle of the day, when the light was high and harsh. And these were mainly Saturdays. The Union Pacific local still ran, but the mine railroad usually did not, leaving me with long drives back to Phoenix, through empty roads and golden light, to ponder what might have been. What I did receive from these journeys was a profound sense of place and how that relates to both railroads and photography. Using a camera has helped me look more intently at the world and it awakened inside me a latent love for landscapes, a love that may ultimately transcend even my love for railroads. Those lessons from Arizona have informed almost every decision I have made with a camera since then. When it comes to wines, when they're young, their primary flavors tend to dominate, so much so that it's easy to miss the subtler notes that grow stronger with time. And as a new photographer, visiting Clifton and Marinci in the summer of 2000, I noticed little more than the contemporary mining and railroad operations. When I finally returned to Arizona in late October 2019, and again in early March of 2020, I found stories that were even richer and far more complex than anything I had imagined 20 years earlier. The town of Clifton itself is incredible, with houses and shanties clinging to the canyon walls and a partially restored business district that hints at the many booms and busts of a mining town. Marinci is the last company town in the state, with long tracks of worker housing and a modern shopping complex owned and operated entirely by the mine. Clifton and Marinci sit on the edge of Arizona's transition zone a narrow geological region between the Colorado Plateau to the northeast and the basin and range to the southwest. Some of the richest copper deposits in the world lie within that transition. Where the Colorado Plateau rose up against the basin and range, the geologic turbulence laid open the rock faces, helping cowboys and soldiers find copper and other minerals in the 1860s. Most early prospectors focused on gold and silver, but copper proved far more abundant and resilient. Demand grew with new technologies like electricity, 
leading to a wave of innovation that has kept copper mining profitable even after 150 years of extraction. Now some of these developments came at great cost. They helped drive out native populations, and they have left deep scars on the land. They have also made possible much of our modern world, providing copper for everything from our earliest power lines right up to today's electric cars, which require about three times as much copper as traditional gasoline vehicles. Now in the 1870s, miners could dig rock straight out of the ground that averaged about 12% copper. With that, all they had to do was take it to a blast furnace and smelt it. And by the late 1880s, the ore content was down to about 6% copper, too low to just throw into a blast furnace. That led to concentrators, crushers and jigs that could separate copper from other materials. Today, they can start with rock and dirt that is far less than 1% copper and concentrate it to 30%. Now, if you're in the copper business, you don't want to move heavy and pure ores very far, so smelters rose all over the clifton Morency Mining District. You can still see some of their remains today, but you have to know where to look. They're like the earthiness in wine. You might not taste it at first, but it's waiting there, below the surface, to be discovered. I had no idea I was standing on top of a smelter site the first time I filled up at the gas station in downtown Clifton, even though the evidence was all around me. That foundation on the north side of the canyon wall that once held the smelter of the Arizona Copper Company. This view looks up the mouth of Chase Creek, where it drains into the San Francisco River. Mines were located all up that canyon in the distance. This smelter closed in 1913, when the Arizona Copper Company opened a new complex three miles to the south. That one closed permanently in 1938, but dark slag piles still mark its location near the railroad. They're easy to miss from ground level, with a drone, you can see them clearly from a few hundred feet up. Much harder to miss is this slag pile right along Highway 191 on the edge of Clifton. And I must have driven past this a dozen times before I knew what I was looking at. The former site of the Shannon Copper Company smelter, which operated here from 1902 until 1919. Ultimately, though, it was the railroads that drew me to Clifton and Morency, and it was only with rail transportation that the region grew to become an industrial juggernaut. David Briggs, a geologist and historian of Arizona mining, wrote, Morency's future prosperity was tied with linking it to the outside world with a railroad. The Coronado Railroad was the region's first. Built in 1879 to the baby gauge of just 20 inches, it connected the smelter in downtown Clifton with mines located up Chase Creek Canyon. In 1882, rails were extended three miles more to the town of Metcalf, and the gauge was widened to the more common 36 inches in 1901. At its peak, the Coronado Railroad ran two pairs of scheduled passenger trains every day, plus up to two dozen freight trains, and Clifton boasted a six-stall engine house. It was all abandoned in 1932, when the Great Depression shuttered the mines. Now as wine ages, its organic compounds start to bond with each other. When they get big enough, they fall out of the liquid as solid sediment, and you can no longer taste them. It's essentially what happened to the Coronado Railroad. Today, scarcely a trace of it remains. The same goes for the many inclines that once hoisted mine cars up and down the canyon walls on precipitous grades. Yet there are remnants of other railroads in what was once a maze of track. Like the remains of the smelters, it took me a while to find them. And I started with what still exists, like the bold flavors and notes that hit you when you first taste or smell a glass of wine. Connection to the outside world arrived at Clifton in 1883 with the narrow gauge Arizona and New Mexico Railway. Converted to standard gauge in 1901, it eventually became part of the Southern Pacific. It's a relatively pedestrian run through empty desert as far as Guthrie, 
but from there to Clifton the route is spectacular, climbing out of the Gila River Valley along the Rattlesnake Cliffs to a summit at South Siding, and then descending a 2% grade through six tunnels and five miles to the banks of the San Francisco River. On weekdays, the Arizona Eastern meets the Industrial Railroad in Clifton to swap cars. Now watching the Industrial Railroad climb out of town from across the valley, you can see company houses in the foreground with terraces of the mine rising in the distance. Between them, if you look closely, you can see another line up the hillside, a line that looks a lot like a railroad grade. This was originally the Narragage Shannon Arizona Railroad, and today it's a hiking trail that offers stunning views of the valley and poignant reminders of railroads past. The 10-mile route connected the Shannon Smelter and Clifton with mines and Metcalf. It closed in 1919 after less than a decade of operation. It's not very long, but it's like a singular event at a grapes growing season, a spike in temperature or a deluge of rain that can completely change a wine's character. In 1922, the Boston-based firm of Phelps Dodge and Company consolidated the region's operations and upgraded the Shannon, Arizona as the sole railroad between Clifton and Morency. It remained in service with two switchbacks until 1965. That's when Phelps Dodge built an all-new line with far fewer curves and a lower average grade of 3%, although parts of it still hit 5%. In 1901, Another narrow gauge line joined the Arizona and New Mexico at Guthrie. The Marinci Southern followed an incredible route through 1,400 feet of elevation in 18 miles, including five complete loops of track. By 1915, two pairs of switchbacks replaced the four uppermost loops when their timber trestles became unstable. The Marinci Southern kept running until 1922, usually with a schedule of two pairs of mixed trains daily. The arid mountains reclaim the works of man slowly, and even after a century, you can still see quite a bit of the Marinci Southern. It's when you're finishing a drink of wine that you taste the tannins. They can be harsh in new wines, leaving an otherwise good glass with a bitter aftertaste. With time, though, tannins can mellow and soften, adding a new layer of texture. Like an old path through the desert, Good tannins can help a wine's best flavors linger long after you've finished your last sip. When you put a bottle of wine in your cellar, the bottle may sit there gathering dust, but on the inside, the wine is in a constant state of chemical reaction. It's always changing. After the Great Depression brought mining to a halt, Marinci faced a serious need for change. As demand for copper increased with the run-up to World War II, Phelps Dodge completely restructured its operations. Underground mining ceased, giving way to an open pit on a mind-boggling scale. Copper production resumed in 1937, with an electric haulage railroad sprawling into the massive new mine. Expansion of the pit has obliterated much of the region's history. The entire town of Marinci had to be picked up and moved more than a mile out of the way of mining operations. The town of Metcalf, once a hub of underground mining and terminus of the Coronado Railroad, vanished completely. US Highway 191, formerly Route 666, goes right through the pit and the road has been realigned and rebuilt several times. It offers stunning views of an operation that has grown so big that it is now visible from outer space. Yet within the vastness, traces of the past still remain. If you look carefully at the hillsides between the hairpin turns just north of Marinci, you can still glimpse the right-of-way of the Marinci Southern Railroad. The copper business continues to evolve, and three big changes came in the 1980s. During a downturn in copper prices, Marinci smelter closed in 1984, and copper has not been smelted there since. Mining continued, 
with copper concentrate shipped by rail to other smelters. Rail operations within the mine ended in 1989, replaced by enormous haul trucks, each with the capacity of three rail cars. And copper production resumed in 1987 through an all-new method, the hydrometallurgical process of solvent extraction and electro-winning, or SXEW. The ongoing chemical reactions in a bottle of wine can help extract its best flavors, and sulfuric acid, combined with electricity, can extract even the faintest traces of copper from low-grade ores, tailings, and waste from past operations. With a much lower environmental impact than smelting, SXEW is nearly an ideal complement to traditional copper production. Smelting typically produces more sulfur dioxide than copper. In the past, smelters simply released sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere as a smelly and toxic byproduct. Now, smelters recover their sulfur dioxide as sulfuric acid, which is then used and ultimately neutralized in the SXEW process. All of this is a boon for rail traffic. In addition to the Marinci operation, the railroad also serves Freeport McMoran Smelter in Miami, Arizona, one of only three active copper smelters remaining in the U.S. Copper concentrate milled at Marinci moves in gondolas to Miami, where it's smelted. Sulfuric acid captured at Miami moves by rail and tank cars back to Marinci, where it's used to produce cathodes that are 99.999% pure copper. And those also leave Marinci by rail in boxcars. It's a rare wine that carries the bold flavors of youth into the structure and balance of maturity. The railroads of Clifton and Marinci are busier now than they ever have been, much busier than when I discovered them back in 2000. The names have changed. Phelps Dodge became part of Freeport McMoran in 2007, the same year Union Pacific sold its line to Iowa Pacific, which in turn sold to Genesee and Wyoming four years later. GNW's Arizona Eastern Railroad runs between Lordsburg and Clifton with two crews. One of them covers the majority of the line between Lordsburg and South Siding. The other works between South Siding and Clifton, sometimes making multiple trips over the 2% grade to interchange with Freeport McMoran and assemble the outbound train for Lordsburg. The Industrial Railroad also uses two crews, and each of them typically makes one trip, and sometimes more between Marinci and Clifton. Loaded cars move in both directions, and in all my years of stalking mountain railroads, I have never heard diesel locomotives working as hard, nor dynamic brakes whining as loudly, as on that grade between Clifton and Marinci. This still happens, five days a week, in a ruggedly beautiful land of arid mountains, rocky cliffs, and verdant rivers, replete with the visual evidence of more than 150 years of industrial activity. For me, it combines so much of what I love about railroad operations with the geography, history, and archaeology I have more recently come to appreciate. That railroads invite study from so many different angles is, perhaps, the greatest reason why my fascination with them is so enduring. Returning to Clifton and Marinci after nearly 20 years was a little like opening an old bottle of wine, and I didn't know quite what to expect. Railroads change, just as wine lives and breathes. Every bottle ages differently, and the truth is, most wines aren't built to last. It's usually best to drink them within a few years of bottling, and just a small percentage truly improves with more time than that. 
Every bottle will eventually hit its peak, when the structure of its many flavors comes into perfect balance, and then it's all downhill from there. Railroads can be like that too, and I think that's a big reason why some of us are so driven to photograph them. We want to catch that peak moment and record it for all time, before the years forever alter the flavors we've come to love. There's something else that happens to wine as it ages. Its color changes. Red wines get lighter, losing their deep purple and turning toward rust and burnt orange. Whites grow darker, first golden and then amber. With enough age, both reds and whites will end up just about the same color. A color, it turns out, that is pretty close to copper. <laughs>